Yeah, Bob Post is on. I'm trying to get it in tomorrow's uh, little thing on team. I try to get everything in there. Sometimes I either doesn't work or, but I try to. All right. Before that, as you can tell behind this, we were talking about cults and special topics. And then I just I put it up and I just realized my numbering system. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cult. So what's your call to get? Oh, no, you're doing. Which one are you doing? Well, what's your call again? Yeah. For the brethren. And then you need to find the call. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sit over there. <laughs> we get to this? Yeah. Oh, we got 1884. So we got, we got Goo Goos, Blaine, yeah. Mugwumps. Mama, where's my pa? Okay, so the election. So we talk about the bloody or oh, so I didn't tell you about um, this. So Cleveland, he was, you know, I know, I know, the most eligible bachelor in America. But it appears as though he had a child out of wedlock. And just as today, that happened all the time, but it was such a scandal because everybody wanted to act like uh, such a moral and upstanding person, especially with 19th century values. So they really hammered him on this. So instead of his, his position on things or government, they hit him on this. Here's cartoon of I want my paw. And the Republicans came up with a very clever slogan, Ma, Ma, where's my paw? Gone to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, you're really struggling if you have to come up with three haws to rhyme with paw, but just go with it. The Democrats countered with James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. Now, that's actually pretty good, but off of that credit mobile era scandal. And when the election happened, Uncle Grover was elected. My relative, Grover Cleveland, was elected president. So the green, in this map, the green are Democrats, the red are Republicans. He took his home state, the solid South. All we, there was no Republican Party down here. So that went here. By this time, by this time, the Grand Roberts Clause and those other uh, voting restrictions have, are now pretty much fully in place or just happening. So the last vestiges of this. There'll be one more little burst of the populace to try to get um, poor sharecroppers and the poor in the South vote. Of, any color skin to try to vote, that would go away at the end of the century. So you'll notice this election. But the popular vote, which remember doesn't matter that much, it's only 20,000 votes across, or 20,000 votes different. And so with that, now I'm looking over and I see about three people looking at their watch. And I know what the watches are. I never wanted one, that's why I don't have one. But let's make sure we don't do that or I'll start taking watches. Okay, so with that, one law would be passed. He promised to do something about railroad rates. And what came up was the Interstate Commerce Act, which created the Interstate Commerce Commission, AKA the ICC. And the commission was specifically created. It was promised to finally do something about price discrimination. Remember the Granger laws were thrown out by the Wabash case. <laughs> Now the federal government is saying, we will regulate railroad rates. Only the federal government can do this because of interstate commerce. In fact, virtually any change like this, everything from civil rights to stopping monopolies to regulation of things, and very important things like uh, railroads or environment or you name it, can only be done by the federal government because of interstate commerce. It can only be done. So you can imagine there's going to be a, an entire industry to try to discredit the federal government. That's going to start pretty much right here. And this cartoon is trying to show like the railroads is a bunch of fucking Broncos that haven't been tamed. And here's some Wranglers going to take care of them. I should add that the, the cowboy myth um, that you know, people from all over the world, uh, all over kind of think about Montana. That really hasn't been created yet. It's still kind of being created. That's more of a 20th century thing. Those who actually did that were considered, considered the low of the low, the bottom of the barrel. 
And now this is a whole mythology that makes me really laugh and really bad television shows about it. But moving on, they regulated railroad rates. So how did the railroads feel about this? They fought this tooth and nail. In fact, they literally were going to members of Congress and saying, I pay for you, I fought you, don't vote for this. And they're saying, but people want this. We have to make it at least look like we're doing something. And then one lawyer, his name was Richard Olney, one lawyer, if you get him, wait a second, that's the answer. We don't need to regulate railroad rates and change that price discrimination. All we have to do is make it look like. Everyone catch that? Look like. If they're going to create a commission of five people appointed by the president, what kind of people can be on this board? He could pick anybody, couldn't he? Including, and the next president would do this, it would be filled with railroad men, specifically lawyers on the pay of the railroads, or lawyers who are other people working. They might work for the railroad, they work for the commission, and then when they're off the commission, what would they go? What would they do? Go back to work on the railroad. And today we have a name for this called the revolving door. Where you have people who go work in these regulatory bodies and they're actually very generous to the companies knowing they'll get a really high paying job when they get out of it. And it's also called regulatory capture. So regulation will control it, but I think these lawyers for the railroad who know I'll be working for the railroad in three years, think they're gonna be tough on the railroads? No way. And then there's one more thing, the law like a lot of laws, or it's going to be written so hackney that they had no power to enforce. They couldn't enforce anything. And so with that, the ICC did nothing. All it could do is suggest. And they realized this by 1889, it was clear that the ICC was not doing what people promised. And it always takes a while for, for things to really gear up and work and get organized. But it was clear. This was a promise, a broken promise. Next, 1888 election occurred. The ICC was not that big of a deal yet. It will be in a couple of years. But this election, Cleveland will want for re-election. Benjamin Harrison of Ohio, of course. Remember, that's now a Republican machine there. His, his grandfather was William Henry Harrison. Remember the president who died a month in office. He was a laissez fair more and more conservative, idea of conservative. Republican. And just so you know, Harrison won in the Electoral College, won a very tight election. Just a few thousand votes different in a couple states. In fact, just a couple thousand votes differently in New York City, or I'm sorry, in New York, and Harris or Cleveland would have won. In fact, Cleveland won the popular vote. More people wanted Cleveland than wanted Harris. But remember, the United States has the Electoral College. And presidential elections are national elections. They're individual little elections in every state. Solid South, Cleveland just barely lost. And, but to give you an idea, Cleveland only had about a thousand more votes. This would not happen again where the president would be elected and not win the popular vote. This would not happen again until 2000. And then happen again in 2016. So it happened once in your lifetime. Two in my lifetime. Yes, I was not quite around then. And if so, if um, a Republican is elected in 2024, just by the way the country is right now, there's no way, unless something radical happens, a Republican would win the popular vote. But they could very well be elected president. So if Trump is reelected, let's say, he would probably lose the popular vote by eight or nine million. Probably. Just by the way the states are. Because, you know, California will vote 70% for the Democrat and things like that. So that's the situation we are now. But Republicans looked at this and thought, we barely won. And we might lose again. And that is why in 1889 and 1890, they created a bunch of states, hoping they would all be GOP. Remember, that's for Republican, grand old public. That's why you have Idaho. Montana, Wyoming, and they split Dakota into two. So that would be four senators and therefore four electors. Utah would be created the next year, assuming that they would all be Republican. 
Now, this didn't quite happen the way they wanted them. Now it is. They're all incredibly Republican. Montana was the last one that was kind of mixed, but now Montana has become a very Republican state. They're also thinking about dividing Montana into two. And the thing, hmm? For two more senators. Now, this is purely politics. The reason Montana is here, there are not near enough people in here to make a, a legislative district. Excuse me. You drink water. It must be dry all day. You know, with the heat on, and it just makes it up in the air very hot. Anybody else? You have average one on coming. So with that, Harrison is not president, but there is this underlying clamor that we must do something about monopolies. We must do something about inflation. We must do something up about high prices and taxes. And so ironically, a laws I fair Republican conservative would be there when three major laws are going to be passed, all in 1890. It didn't pop up at the same time. So 1890. <laughs> the first one, the Sherman Silver Purchasing Act. And this would purchase every month, go to various mines and buy $4 million a month of silver. That's 4.5 million. What's this abbreviation for at this time? Yeah, that's ounces. Yes. Yeah, we got from buy. So the United States government using taxpayer money. And the whole thought was they would take this money. It was just implied in the bill. What are they going to do with this silver? They will mint silver coins, get them into circulation, and thus creating inflation. That is the goal. Did it happen? No. They actually took the silver, and this is true, almost all of it. They took the silver bars and at first put it in the basement of the U.S. Treasury and in the basement of various government buildings. Just silver sitting in the basement. They didn't do anything with it. Now, this did pump up the economy a little bit. You know, $4 million a month, especially this, a lot of money. That's people with a lot of money, especially in places like, let me give you an example. Butte. The gold that played out in Butte, but they had silver. But silver wasn't that valuable. All of a sudden, they're buying $4 million a month. This saved the mines in the region. And remember, I told you this before. What important mineral, what important ore is always next to silver? Copper. And so they were ready to dig copper out of the hill in the 1890s when they needed it for electricity. And that is why Butte would be a relatively small town with absolutely balloon in population. And be nearly 100,000 people by the end of the century, and be 120,000 people by 1919. And that's why it's a big ghost town now, because it's like 28,000. And you have to go through Butte, all these abandoned buildings. I like Butte, but it has that weird ghost town feel. So, next. So, a promise didn't really deliver. Next, an even more important bill, the Sherman Antitrust Bill. Remember, trust is synonymous with the monopoly. John Sherman was a very prominent Republican from Ohio and one of the older Republicans, still that kind of free labor, Lincolnite, not laws I fair necessarily. His brother was William Tecumseh Sherman, remember the March to the Sea, who actually died the year before this. So Sherman, a very prominent senator. And this said, no illegal restraint of trade. Now it's written by law, so it's going to be confusing, but what's an illegal restraint of trade? Well, the legal restraint of trade they're talking about is monopoly, using monopoly power to drive out competition, to use your power to do everything from making deals with other companies and icing out small competitors to forcing consumers to only buy from you, things such as that, monopoly power. So using the power is big to drive out competition. And so basically, it's saying that monopolies, by definition, is fraud. At least that's what it's implied. And I'll give you an example of this. The phone and all the apps on there. Apple rates it so they make sure you buy apps that they have either a part ownership or own. So they profit from this. And they rig it to get you to do that because they have a monopoly. And so they, they break the system to keep competition out, so they make money. 
Microsoft does. You can really see it in technology. Really see it. Of course, everything's monopolies. But that's what happened. Yes. So the Chinese trust Act said there was, that you couldn't illegally restrain trade. Wouldn't it already be illegal to do an illegal activities? The thing about it was is that states might have the laws, but in the interstate commerce, that was not clear. And so they basically said that. What everybody could do in states was they oh, we're saying it's not better. So there, good question. That's how they, they made it better. And therefore, now interstate commerce, we won't allow this. The problem is this: it said all this in language that no one could understand. It never made clear what a monopoly was. It never made clear what a legal restraint of trade was. It said it, it implied it, everybody knew it, but it never said it in the law. And so it was. Totally indecipherable. The law is kind of shocking. You read this, and it says in the summary, we're going to stop illegal restraint trade. Yet it allows for holding companies. It does all of these things that kept, keeps that going. And it didn't really have a solid enforcement. It had to be a lawsuit brought up by the Attorney General of the United States, which is cumbersome and very difficult to do. And that's one of the problems with antitrust all the way until you have an attorney general and a justice department that's really going to aggressively do this. It takes a lot of determination by the president to do this. Uh, we, did, we didn't until the 1930s. A little bit in the teens uh, with Teddy Roosevelt, but in the 1930s and the New Deal, all the way to the end of the 1970s. But then President Reagan and this conservative revival said monopolies are basically are good for business. And so 40 years, they did nothing about antitrust. The Biden administration is the first administration since probably Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s to really start actively going against antitrust. But we'll see where that goes. If you believe it or you believe that's good or bad, we'll see where it's going to go. And this is mostly for Democrats, but there's also a significant number of Republicans who are for this, especially from rural states, because the big uh, egg companies and like John Deere and places like that just totally cheap people. If you own a John Deere tractor, you have to pay to get it fixed. You can't fix it yourself. They shut it off. There's no right to repair it. Even if you own the tractor, you have, you have to pay them to get it repaired. Because okay. of all that software. Can't do it. It sits in the shelves. It's a big, big deal. And they're doing right now, it's in the Federal Trade Commission to do something about it. So it's, it's happening right here in Montana. So it seemed like inflation. It seemed like they're going to do something about trust. But SATA, as it's called, is still the law of the land. And that is why when we say anti monopoly today, the weird thing in the US would say antitrust, because that legacy exists. Even though it would it would be better to say anti-monopoly. I think people would understand what that means. Antitrust, it's still like, what? What? And then the McKinley tariffs. So William McKinley, an up and coming senator from guess what state? He's a Republican, Ohio, was coming up with an idea. Or I'm sorry. He proposed, it was written for him by somebody else, a tariff. And all through the tariff, it was a prompt, and they promised to cut the tariff. We're going to cut the tariff with the committee cut the tariff. It passed the Senate a small tariff cut, a, a bill just like it passed the House. And then they have to come together. It's called a, a conference committee. So the House and the Senate come together and they write a bill. Right? They agree on a bill. They agree they pass the tariff. Guess what the tariff did? No, a significant increase. Just kidding about the cut. Ah, we didn't mean it. They raised tariffs in some places by up to a third. They promise cuts, promise cuts, promise cuts, promise cuts. The bill passed the race. Raise the tariff. And so, promise fail, promise fail, promise fail. In fact, the Sherman Antitrust Act would be used against labor unions more than, Trump, than monopolies for the first 15 years of his existence. And so, here is a good, you ever seen the, you know, the, use the sledgehammer to ring the bell to show your strength, these carnival games. And I, uh, this, the, the carnival worker, which is a politician, so rigging the system for the trust. And there's the tariff and there's the consumer. That creepy face is supposed to be, I guess you're hit with a sledgehammer, you will have a creepy face. Has anyone ever done this at a carnival? 
How'd you do? I was humble. <laughs> it's rigged. The harder you try to hit it, almost all the, the lower it goes. Yeah. So I, I, I know how to do it. So last time I did it, I just kind of set it on there, bing, right to the top. So moving on. So ICC and then these three left this idea going in the 1890s that no one cares. And then you have that homestead strike in 1892 and that feeling that nobody cares about workers, about farmers. And that's going to lead to the People's Party. A new party will be formed. And the People's Party, they'll be dubbed on the Fondlings. But it's the People's Party. So this is the Fondlings. And the whole point is we're not the elite. Farmers and miners. And tents were the main element. They tried to get laborers, but I'll tell you why that didn't work in just a second. They despised social Darwinism. And they had a very good point. Small farmers worked their tail off. Sun up to sun down. How can you say they're not working hard and immoral, lazy people because they're poor? The system's rigged, they said. And their point was they believed in elements of capitalism, but we have to reform it or it's going to blow up. And so a couple things about it. First off, it was a hodgepodge of other parties, like the Farmers Alliance, which started from the... Uh, uh, from the grain to try to be political for a while, the Knights of Labor, socialists, free silver who wanted to coin silver, greenbacks who wanted uh, paper money, all these little tiny parties. Also, the Prohibition Party joined in who wanted to end alcohol, these little tiny parties. And a couple elements about they wanted the people to have power, not the wealthy, democracy, not plutocracy. And this is the era where that word started to be used more and more government by the rich. Also, they had a concept of social morality. We have a responsibility to the community and property has to be secondary to community. And the one they talked about a lot was land monopolies. Now you might be wondering what a land monopoly was. Think about the big landowners and sharecroppers. Why should you own the land and get rich off of my work just because you claim to own the land? That and they knew, this is 1890s, 1880s. They knew where the land came from. Why should you claim the land from people, uh, that, um, that was also stolen from somebody else? They knew where it came from. They talked about it a lot. Of course, they also a lot of them thought, I should be able to the right to steal it from American Indians. But anyways, the rights of property. And so they're talking about land monopoly and they're hoping to get to people in the city right to pay very high rents. But also, you can't do whatever you want with your railroad. It directly affects people's lives. How can you gouge us and starve us by high rail rates just so you can get rich? But they have problems. It's rural. They're isolated. They feel alienated from the city. They feel alienated from all the different people coming in the city. And so they never really appealed to urban people, even though they tried. They were anti-urban, the main member. They didn't like the big city. Anti-immigrant, too. Anti-intellectual. They saw those with the college education. They saw the lawyers and the bank and all cheating them. So they said, you're a bunch of pointy heads. That's what they call intellectuals. Pointy heads. And they were intensely anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic because of that, that myth from Middle Ages that Jews control the banks. Pure garbage, but that was a belief. And it was incredibly strong that Jews control the banks. In fact, most of the Jewish immigrants came to the United States were pure poor uh, farmers who were forced off their land or literally ran off their land in what is now Russia. And so, but this anti-Semitism, this was the most racist time. And as banks became more important, anger over debt became more important. It's no coincidence that anti-Semitism rose in Europe, too. And so with that, the People's Party never really appealed. But it's an important idea because in Omaha, they met in Omaha. Omaha. Why Omaha? Right here in the center of the new farmers all coming to this area here. After the populist movement really began in Kansas. 
Cantus was like this, um, this storm of populism and change coming through. But Omaha's where they had the convention. And uh, what's the abbreviation to announce again? Um, okay. So with that, I'm sure there might be a book written about this. Maybe. Where does it start? With a storm in Kansas. So, in Omaha, this hodgepodge of people, who the very wealthy said, look at those bunch of yokels, which of course said, see, I told you they hate us, but they wanted a series of things. First off, their number one thing was inflation, and the code for inflation was free selling. All free silver meant was we want inflation. And the big thing is they just want to get off the gold standard. They wanted to get off the gold standard to allow for more currency or in, in the circulation. And part of that was let's now allow for not just gold, but silver and coin silver and have the government pay for it. free coinage, free silver. But the big thing is it's anti gold standard, just generically. And that slogan became the slogan of the populace. Everything they stood for would be iron or would be coalesced into free silver, which is a pretty clever thing to do. I'm going to go through this, and a lot of it's going to seem kind of complex. How do you explain that? Free silver? Oh, I understand. I might get more money. By the way, just printing more money does not create inflation. I mean, if I, if, uh, I print, a, uh, if I, the government, I print a bunch of money, give you a bunch of money, and you take that money and bury it in your backyard, does that create inflation? No, it's got to be spent. Got to get out in the economy. Just printing money. But they were hoping it would be spent. Next, they're very anti-bank. They're all in debt. They're farmers. So they want banks, government banks, like a federal government bank out of the post office, which existed all the way from the New Deal to the 1970s. And to be honest, I kind of like the idea of the savings account, get small loans there, be guaranteed. Or public banks, meaning owned by the government or states. North Dakota was a very populous bank, and they have North Dakota. There's the North Dakota State Bank is owned by the state of North Dakota. It's so weird. North Dakota was such a populous state with these reforms, and now it's the exact opposite. The government always wants to get rid of it. Now they're very conservative, but they're so popular the state they never get it. So, so drought in North Dakota, they have private banks, you know, owned by private companies. And then these North Dakota state banks. Montana almost did. It almost passed a couple different times. The Anaconda Company fought it too for them. Next, they're antitrust. Anti monopoly. Very anti monopoly. Next, they want public control over industries that directly affect people's lives. So they want public control of things like railroads. Or they can see the future. They knew the importance of telegraph, but they also included phones. It was just brand new, but they could see how that information could change everything. And also electricity. They could see it. They either wanted actual government control or really strict regulation to make sure they can't gouge people. And we have elements of that right now. After the 1930s of like public utilities like Northwestern Energy was regulated by the state. Looser than it used to be regulated. And so if they want to raise their rates, they have to go to what's called the Public Service Commission, an elected body in Montana. So that's regulated. So the idea is the Public Service Commission would not let them gouge. Because, you know, in winter, we need things like heat. What a great time to raise the prices on electricity or natural gas or whatever it might be. I should add, the Public Service Commission is pretty favorable to business. And so they allow for a big rate increase. So utilities down about, about a third cost of the And I'm just noticing that because I just realized I paid a third more. Oh, wow, that was a lot. Moving on. Direct election of senators. And so they wanted the people of the state to elect the two senators, not the state assemblies. More democracy. They also wanted a progressive income tax. Now, progressive income tax means the higher, well, let me rephrase that. Who pays more? Who pays a bigger percentage of their income? The wealthy or the working people? For progressive. 
A progressive income tax idea was the rates would go up the more money you make. The idea is since they're controlling all the profits, we got to choose something out of that. That's where the money is at. But also, higher taxes don't allow them to do profit taking. And that actually increases, I'm using terminology of the day, like research and development of new products. If it's harder to pocket it, they put it back in the company. It also raises wages. It's no coincidence that the highest wage growth in American history was at a time for working people, was also the highest income taxes in American history. The highest wage growth in American history was 60s, 1960s, and 1970s. At that time, there were, there were 30 different tax rates. The highest marginal income tax rate was 91. Only about 20 people paid it. And that was the highest wage growth in American history. So with that, they also were very pro-union and one of the things the union wanted. Of course, they couldn't appeal the union workers, but they, their, their uh, platform was. So things like we talked about, child labor law, eight-hour workday, they also wanted what we call today Social Security, which is an old age pension. Because one of the scariest thing about work in this new system called capitalism, you go to work, even if you love your job or your job, that doesn't matter. You work, but eventually you get to that point where you, you can no longer work. And yet you're still alive. Then what? I'm a third number of children. They started making the old folks home where they would just warehouse old people until they died. What do you do? But if you have a pension, that means you can retire from it. That would be passed during the oh, so all these things. That will happen during the New Deal. It's called Social Security. And all of this goes against laws of America. Like conservatives today, like right now, like in the US House of Representatives, they're talking about cutting Social Security right now for retired people. You're not retired. I'm getting close. So I'm this is definitely on my mind. They also believed in women's and civil rights. One of the leaders of the populace was Mary Elise of Kansas. And she, one of the leaders, she's, she's this fiery orator and didn't have the right to vote. But also equal rights, even though they said it, there were a lot of people who were not white in the populist movement, especially in the South, racism still was a problem. And this would eventually become the basis of what we call liberal economics. So regulated capitalists, some controls, but it's still a market, still capitalists, trying to even the playing field. So this is the basis of it. But also, some of these things, like especially this, 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 who else wanted this that we've talked about? Who's that? Unions wanted it, yeah. Is that anybody else? And it's socialist, isn't it? Isn't it modern socialism? So when they attack the populace, what are they going to call them? Bomb throwing anarchists. Very good. And so with that, almost all of these would happen in the New Deal, a little bit in the progressive era, but the New Deal. You'll notice there's no health care on there. Health care was still like so vague, you know, pretty random if you're going to live or die. In 40 years, they start saving people routinely. And it's also shockingly expensive. So with that, 1892, then this election is going to be quite exciting. You're going to have the two old parties. Cleveland's going to run again. He claims to be anti-monopoly, but no one trusts him after the ICC. Harrison, laws I fair. And with those three laws, it's it's already clear by 1892. It's not doing what people had hoped. And the tentacles of Monopoly, there's Lady Liberty. That's a good cartoon. I like that one. And then I don't know why I put the populace on the bottom. <laughs> there's a third party, a third way. James Weaver of Iowa ran as the populist candidate. But they're running in local elections, House and the Senate, the populist. And when the election finally happened, Cleveland would be reelected, the first president to serve non-consecutive terms. Winning all over, getting back his home state. 
but look how well in green the populists did. And even though the populists didn't win Montana, they split the Democratic vote in Montana, and that's why Harrison got it. The populists were actually really strong in Montana. Because uh, uh, they were fighting the Anaconda monopoly, copper company. And so this is a big shift, a third party. And the thing is, with this third party, it looks a little like 1854. Remember when the Republicans were created, the Whigs were dying, there's a know-nothing party in the Democrats. And it's also coming out of the Democrats. And so the last thing we got to get, I know the vote's probably already ring, but the last thing, the panic of 1890. A massive economic panic is going to hit. The worst one in American history up to that time. It was a lot worse than 1873. It was shocking how bad it was. And it started with the same basic element we talked about before when I did the, you know, the boom bus cycle. Oversupply and railroads. Over speculation um, and a speculative bubble. And they're making all these new bonds they call financial instruments today that were a ways to invest and speculate. But they were all pretty crooked. And today we'd say they're, they, you might have heard these terms before, and they're really complex, like derivatives or credit default swaps or credit default or um, um, certified domestic obligations. All are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's for good reason, because no one knows what they are. And they, this is a picture of it. See the flim flam finance? That's from 1893. A flim flam man. It's a, it's a crook. Somebody who gains your trust, a.k.a. confidence, and convinces you to buy something or invest something, and it's really a crook. Another term for that is a grifter. Another term for that is somebody who gained your confidence is a what? Good, but another name. Have you ever heard con man? They gained your confidence. Flip my mouth. I like Flynn Flam Man with a Sumi Yaps. Grifter is my favorite term for that. There's a lot of grifters running around. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Don't trust big spiders with Flynn Flam finance on their bellies. Not right now, but I'm going to look at it now. Okay, thank you. You bet. And just as a reminder, oh, I'm good. Yeah. A few of us will be on tomorrow. Why? What you told me about? I forgot. No, I'm older than my brother. We're going to go to Missoula. Oh, okay. Yeah, I told you. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Right. So I'll record this and we finish up populism. Okay. Sound good? Why is the registration for your service? Okay. And, uh, okay, that's tomorrow. Ugh, I forgot. Yeah, get it. And, uh, yeah, goodbye. Great. You're going to be able to do and Oh, I hear it. I hear it. I my group. Oh my gosh. Who did it? Who did it? What class? And we're drawing like a course. Oh. No, the form is so much fun.
No, okay. I'm kind of tall. Like, okay, like have a logical idea for a fly. Right. And then, then it's like, no, war pigs. <laughs> And then they're like, smoke. Oh. So you've just explained why I never liked group projects. Oh. It's always going to be Yale. Stop me. Don't let me do it. Oh, I'm not, am I? Do you really want it? Then I want No. Well, it's not paper one to ten. Oh. It was twelve. I put one question on. Broom. Don't forget the brooms. Do you have any questions for the readings? Oh, yeah. What? Well, the quiz is the next week. Oh, I don't work like the next week. Say it again, Bob. No, no, no. I took it all along. No, only thing we have to do is if it's, uh, yeah, like a full sentence. And that's just the use of it. This one, pin, thanks all. Yeah. Done. Done, I know, I'm talking. Yeah, I'm this is a top one. I don't I don't I don't the I don't know. I don't I don't know. I Got it. Okay. How far? Oh, there's my big question. I guess. Also, no. Why? All right, Ashley, the paper. Let's do it. Go. Do you want to take it or wait? Wait. Leave on. Leave my presence. Leave my presence. Hey, you got to make rules here. Huh? Yeah. That's an interesting rule. I think it should be up for. Send it up to the committee. Send it to the committee. Let them hash it out. Then it will go up and then we'll go to the into the conference. And then we'll cycle it back and see if there's any changes that need to be made in the committee. All right. And then we'll send it to the office. And then we'll go to the Senate and come together in the conference. Committee. Now you know how laws are. And so sometime by 2025, we'll ignore, we'll have forgotten all about it. Feel better now? Begin. I'll leave one coffee, so I'm going to put Good? No questions? Let's do it. I'm going to tell you something. That groundhog lies all the time. The all the time. I don't trust anything groundhog says. Uh, no, nope, there's going to be another 16 years of winter. Tomorrow, forecast for tomorrow. Dark. And then sound. All right. I, 
I accidentally put a question on that wasn't part of this part of this one. So number eight, that's what would happen. Number eight, the answer is G. So all of you start with one point. Yeah, it's, so at least you're 10%. Okay. Oh, I'm filming the